Hello and welcome back to stats. All right, so today we're going to start looking at actual regression equations. So not just correlation and scatter plots, um, but actual equations that are trying to model what we're seeing in those graphs. So let's start with just a, dis a definition for a regression line. So a regression line is a line that describes how a response variable and remember the response variable is our y changes as an explanatory variable which again is our x also changes All right. and then what we usually use these for is we often use these or we often use a regression line to predict the value of y for a given x. So the big idea or the general kind of idea here is that you look at what happens in the past, all right? So you look at two variables, you say, all right, what has happened in the past? What is the relationship between these two variables in the past? We model that relationship with an equation, and then we use that equation to make predictions about what will happen in the future. So we're kind of saying, all right, if this is what happened in the past and we think this relationship is still true, then we can use it to predict what's going to happen in the future. All right, so we do this in all sorts of things. You know, We might look at different financial things and say, all right, this is what happened in the past, so this is what I'm predict is, I predict is going to happen in the future. Uh, they're doing this sort of thing with like COVID right now. So like, this is what happened in the past. This is what we know about these diseases. So let's use that information to predict what's going to happen in the future. All right. So it's trying to make more intelligent decisions about what's going to happen in the future um, based on what has happened in the past. All right. So here's an example. Can a student's resting heart rate be used to predict his or her heart rate after one minute of exercise? All right, so this might be a moment where you're actually glad to be at home instead of in school. Because um, if you're in school, I would make you take your pulse um, just sitting there. We would record all that data. Um, and then I would have us do a minute of exercise. It would be your choice, um, but we would agree on something together. So it might be jumping jacks, it might be push-ups, it might be whatever, but we would do a minute of exercise. Um, and then we would remeasure our heart rates and we would make a scatter plot of that. All right, so we might make a scatter plot down here just for the sake of an example. And we might say, all right, down here is your resting heart rate. And on this y-axis is your um, heart rate with exercise. All right. And what we would probably see is that there would be some sort of positive relationship. So if you had a higher resting heart rate, you'd probably have a higher heart rate after exercise, but it's not going to be totally linear, but there's probably going to be some sort of relationship going on here where in general, as the one goes up, the other also goes up. All right. And again, we would then just kind of have people try to estimate what the equation might be. 
and then we would run the actual equation. All right, now we don't have any data to really do this right, right now because we're just doing it via video. Um, but the idea is just to kind of get a, a feel for like, all right, like how close is your estimate to um, what it is in actuality? And again, there's nothing that you need to do here from home. Um, it's more just kind of a feel for like, all right, like, you know, do we do a good job of trying to like visually figure out the relationship or do we need the equations? Do we need um, the tools to, to actually assess what's going on? And usually what we find is that, yeah, you need, um, you need the tools to, to get a better read on what's actually happening here. But the idea is the regression line is going to be sort of the one that for right now, I'm just going to say goes through like the center of the points that's not exactly accurate, but for right now, that's a, a, a good enough kind of mental picture of what's going on, is we're trying to go through sort of the center of these points here um, so that in, on average, these points are as close to this line um, as absolutely possible. So we're taking what's happened in the past, we're creating a simplified version of that, and then we're going to use that line to make predictions about the future. All right. So let's take a look at the form of what you're usually going to see in a regression equation. So this is sort of the general format. All right. And we say this as y hat equals a plus bx. Um, now, I will fully admit that this is a little confusing because in stats, um, b is referred to as the slope. Whereas in algebra, B is the y-intercept. Um, and if you go to your calculator um, and you go to stat calc, you will see that there's a linear regression AXB and there's a linear regression A plus BX. All right? They do the same exact thing. They do the same exact calculation. The only difference is this one labels A as the slope and B as the y-intercept. So this is like the algebra version. Um, and this is the stat version that labels B as the slope and A as the y-intercept. But just realize they're going to give you the same exact numbers. They're going to give you the same exact results. It's just that in the stats world, B is usually used for the slope versus in the algebra world, B is used as the y-intercept. So just try to keep that straight in your head. Um, because it can be somewhat confusing. All right, so what do we want to put in this box here? One, we're just going to say that this right here is generally referred to as y hat. All right, and it is the predicted y value. for a given x value. Right. B is just the slope. All right, so again, I know that's a little confusing, but bear with me. All right, and it is the amount y is predicted to change with a one unit shift in X and then A for us is the Y intercept and it is the predicted value of y when x equals 0. All right. And the thing to know about this is in a real world setting, this may or may not be meaningful.
Now, it's still part of our equation, oops, but there are going to be times when our equation, it doesn't really make sense to have an x of zero in a real world setting. So at that point, like the y-intercept, it's still the value, it's still part of the equation, um, but it doesn't have any meaning in terms of the setting or the context that we're working in. Um, and you'll see what I mean by that in a second. All right, so let's just take a look at some examples. And these early examples should be stuff that you're familiar with, all right? There's nothing kind of crazy going on here, um, but I also don't want to take anything for granted. So we're going to go over some of this from the ground up so that we're, we're clear that everybody's on the same page. All right, so here's a pretend equation, all right? This equation is trying to predict the amount of fat in a Burger King sandwich given that you know the protein level. All right, so this is saying the predicted fat equals 6.8 grams plus 0.97 times the amount of protein in the sandwich. So we're trying to predict how much fat is in the sandwich given that we know how much protein is in the sandwich. So first question says, what are the explanatory, what are the response variables in this regression? The explanatory is just going to be protein. And the response is going to be fat. All right, remember the response variable is your y, which in this case would be our fat. The explanatory is your x, which in this case would be our protein. So that's how that one would break down. All right. What is the slope and what does it mean in this context? So slope is 0.97. That part's easy. Um, and it's the context part that I want to focus on because I wanted you to get away from thinking of these as just equations and think about them as modeling some sort of real world relationship. All right. So what does it mean in this context? All right. It means that for each extra gram of protein, we expect 0.97 grams of fat. So roughly, we're expecting sort of a one-to-one -one relationship between protein and fat. Not exactly, but basically as protein goes up by a gram, we also expect fat to go up by a gram. All right? Again, not exactly because it's 0.97, not 1, but that's the general idea here. All right? What is the y-intercept? Again, that's sort of the easy part. That's just the value of the x next to it, 6.8. All right? What does it mean in this context? All right. In this context, it's the amount of fat we would expect in a sandwich with zero grams of protein. All right. So let's take a look at another one. All right. This is an equation that revolves around hurricanes. All right. So it's trying to predict the max wind speed in a hurricane based off this measure of central pressure. All right. So you can see this as being a very relevant equation. Um, if you're trying to predict how damaging, how dangerous a hurricane is, you're probably going to want to know something about its max wind speed. And that's the big idea with these regression equations is we're usually not just making them to make them. Um, we're usually making them to have some sort of prediction or some sort of insight about the world around us. So again, what are the explanatory? What are the responses? All right, the explanatory is going to be our X, which in this case is central pressure. 
and our response variable is going to be our y, which in this case is max wind speed. Alright, what is the slope? Again, from just an algebra perspective, it's negative 0.897. All right, but what does that mean in this context? It means for every one unit, the central pressure increases. we would expect the max wind speed. To drop, because it's a negative slope, by 0.897. All right, so again, we're seeing there's this relationship between pressure and wind speed, and as the pressure increases, we expect the max wind speed to drop, and as the pressure decreases, we expect the max wind speed to increase. All right, so what is the y-intercept? That's 955.27. All right, and what does that mean in this context? Um... It is the predicted speed uh, predicted, let's add max wind speed when the pressure is zero, right? Which isn't really a realistic situation which is why you don't actually see wind speeds of 955 miles an hour or anything like that. All right, so that's kind of an example of this isn't going to happen, so this might not be meaningful, but it's still necessary when we're creating the relationship just from like an algebra point of view, all right, to get the right line that we need. All right, so let's just look at some very basic calculations that we can do with these. Um, again, I'm not expecting any of this to be new, um, it should be all stuff that you've done before, but we'll just go through it quick um, to make sure that we're all on the same page. All right, so how many grams of fat would you expect in a sandwich with 20 grams of protein? So a lot of this is just plugging things into formulas. All right, so we know that the predicted fat is 6.8 plus 0.97 times the protein, we were just told the protein was 20 grams. So we plug those in there, and you should get that predicted fat is 26.2, right, which coincidentally is also the same length as a marathon. Not that I did that on purpose. Or did I do it on purpose? Yeah, I mean, I probably did. Let's let's be honest. Um, but there you go. All right, predicted fat would be 26.2 with a sandwich that has 20 grams of protein. All right, how many grams of protein would you expect a sandwich with 50 grams of fat to have? So more or less the same question. We're just working in reverse. So instead of plugging in for protein, we're plugging in for fat. So if we put 50 grams on the fat side equals 6.8 plus 0.97 times the protein. And then again, this becomes a pretty simple equation to solve. Um, so you're just subtracting 6.8 from both sides. You're dividing by 0.97. So really quick, I can do that on here. So 50 minus 6.8 divided by... 0.97. All right, you're going to get 44.5. So we can say 44.5 grams equals 
protein. All right, so again, nothing crazy here. Um, I'll put the grams up here as well. Um, just very basic algebra um, when you're plugging things into these. Now, let's take a look at C here. An actual sandwich containing 20 grams of protein has 19.5 grams of fat. Find the residual. All right, the residual is the distance between the actual value and the predicted value. So it's actual minus predicted. All right. Way I like to think of it um, when you're trying to remember the order is they're AP exams, they're not PA exams. Um, so the A becomes before the P. Um, and again, the A is for actual and the P is for predicted. But remember, this equation is using the past to make predictions about the future. So once we've made our predictions, sometimes it's good to say like, okay, here is our prediction. Let's see what actually happened. All right, let's gather more data and see what actually happened. And then we can figure out how far we were off or like how, what, how much error there was in our prediction. And we call that error the residual. All right, so an actual sandwich containing 20 grams of protein um, had 19.5 grams of fat. So our actual is 19.5. That's what was actually observed. Minus the predicted, all right, that's this number up here. So 26.2. All right, so we end up with a residual of negative 6.7 grams. So in this case, our prediction was too high, so our residual ended up being um, a negative value. All right. Now, you might think that's weird, like, all right, when your prediction is too high, um, why is your residual negative? All right. Um, and that has to do with whether the points are kind of falling above or below the regression line. So sometimes it can seem a little counterintuitive, but when you look at it graphically, um, it does make sense because what this is saying here is if this was your regression line, the actual point was 6.7 grams below that line. So right there, this is your residual um, because the line is your prediction and the point is your actual. So the actual is below the prediction line, which is why the residual is negative 6.7. So yes, your guess was too high, but your residual is actually a negative 6.7, not a positive 6.7. All right, and sometimes that's just takes a second to wrap your head around because you would kind of say like, oh, if your prediction was too high, shouldn't the residual be positive? But it deals with the relationship between the lines and the, the, the data on like a scatter plot. All right, so let's just do another one of these to make sure that we're on the same page here. Um, so, Hurricane Katrina, what maximum wind speed would you expect for a hurricane with a central pressure measurement of 920 millibars? All right, so again, predicted max value would be the 955.27 minus 0.897 times the 920 millibars. Right. And then you're just doing that calculation out and you're going to get the predicted max wind speed is, let's see, 955.27 minus 0.897 times 920. Alright, so it's all just typed in there. Hit enter 130.03. So again, going in the opposite direction, the actual measured maximum wind speed for this hurricane was 110 knots. Okay, so I guess it wasn't miles per hour like I said earlier. Um, what is the residual? All right, so again, residual, actual, minus predicted. 
All right, so it tells us the actual measurement was 110. All right, we just saw that the predicted measurement was 130.03, which means our residual is going to be negative 20.03 knots. So again, the negative residual is showing that our guess was too high compared to the actual value. All right, and then C is the one we're actually, where we're working backwards here. Um, what central pressure would you expect for a hurricane that reached a maximum speed of 140 knots? So again, you're just kind of reversing it and you're doing some simple algebra. So 140 knots equals the 955.27 minus the 0.897 times central pressure. So you've got some very simple algebra there where you're just going to subtract both sides by 95527 and then divide by 0.897. So again, I can just do this here. 140 minus 955.27. Right, and then divide by negative 0.897. All right, and I end up with... 908.89, so we'll say uh, 908.89, and we now know this is in millibars, and that is telling us our central pressure. All right, so yes, it's just very basic algebra, um, but you want to kind of think of these not just as like random equations, but modeling some sort of real world phenomena. Um, and we're keeping them simple right now with just one X and one Y. But a lot of times these are being built with 30 X's or 40 X's or the giant equations um, where you're putting in all sorts of variables to try to predict more complex relationships. So. And here we're keeping it very simple with a simple with a single x and a single y. Um, but as you get more sophisticated with this type of analysis, you're using multiple x's um, to predict a single sort of factor. Because um, if you think about something as complicated as like COVID spread, there's not like one variable that we can use. There's all sorts of things that we have to look at, like what's the base infection rate? You know, what percentage of the population is wearing masks? How much traveling are they doing? Um, what, you know, what's the, what business activity is going on? What's open? What's closed? All of those things can feed into a regression equation to help predict what the spread is going to be in the future and what sort of things you have to worry about. So again, we're keeping it simple by keeping it with one X and one Y. Um, as you go further and further into this field, um, it gets a lot more complicated and there's a lot more things that you have to worry about when trying to build these equations if you want your predictions to be relatively accurate. All right, last page here, extrapolation. All right, it's a fun word to say. You say it right now. I mean, you're home, you're in a room by yourself, just say it, it's fun, trust me. All right, the use of a regression line for prediction far outside, I don't know why I put an E there, um, far outside the interval of values for the explanatory variable used to create the regression equation. All 
And then the note we're going to put on here is such predictions are often inaccurate. All right, so there's a mouthful there, but the general idea is Let's say you're building your regression equation and you only have x values that range from like 20 to 40. All right, again, it doesn't even matter what we're talking about here, but you have x values that range from 20 to 40 and you use those x values and their y values to make your regression equation. You shouldn't then use your regression equation to predict an x of 90 or predict an x of 220. Um, your regression equation is really only valid over the interval that you have data on. So if you don't have inter if you don't have some data on that interval, you shouldn't try to predict outside of what you have information on because you have no idea if the relationship changes, right? Maybe the relationship is one thing um, from values 20 to 40, but then from values 80 to 120, it has a totally different relationship. Um, and if you don't have data on that, you don't know that the relationship changes and as such, your predictions could be horribly inaccurate. All right, so let's take a look at a little example here. Lab mice. All right, the weight of male white laboratory rats for the first 25 weeks after birth is predicted by the following regression equation. Weight is measured in grams and time is measured in weeks. All right, what is the slope of the regression equation? What does it mean in this context? All right, so again, the slope would be 40. And the, 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 the context or the, the meaning of that slope is that the weight of the mice increases by 40 grams for each extra week they're alive. All right. What is the y-intercept and what does it mean in this context? All right. So the y-intercept would be 100 grams. All right. And the meaning of this is it's basically the weight of the mice at birth which is the equivalent of zero weeks old, all right? And that's what I'm saying is, it's not just looking at this equation and saying, oh, it's y equals 100 plus 40x. It's thinking about what do those numbers actually represent in context, all right? This is basically how quickly it's growing week to week, and this is basically its starting birth weight. And it's thinking about the equations in those terms instead of just x's and y's. So predict the, the rat's weight after 16 weeks. All right, so predicted weight. All right, this would just be our simple 100 plus 40 times 16. All right, and that's going to give us a predicted weight of 740 grams. All right, and this prediction would be perfectly valid because we have data on the first 25 weeks. Then it says, use this line to predict the rat's weight after two years. All right, now two years is 104 weeks. That is well outside the range that we have data on. So what happens when we extrapolate? All right, so if we look at the predicted weight when we start at 100 grams and we're saying that it adds 40 grams per week and now we're saying it's been alive for 104 weeks. All right, this gets us to 4,160 grams. All right, which you may or not be aware of is basically a nine pound rat which would be a very large, very massive rat.
all right? And this is sort of the example of what happens when you extrapolate. You can get these results that just don't make sense and are not realistic, all right? This model might be perfectly valid for the first 25 weeks of the rat's or mice, um, rats or the rat's life, but once you go beyond 25 weeks, it's possible the relationship changes, all right? Just like a, a model that charts how humans grow, all right, that model is going to look different from 0 to 18 than it's going to look from 18 to 60. Um, so you can't always trust that one model is going to be good for the entire lifespan of what you're looking at. You might need different models for different sections, um, which is why extrapolation is dangerous. If you go outside of what you have data on, you're setting yourself up to enter a zone where the model has changed or the relationship has changed. And if that's true, your predictions are going to be wildly inaccurate. Now, there's another video um, that I've posted to the assignment, and you can watch that video to get some appreciation um, for the dangers of extrapolation. Um, and it relates to this setting that we have right here. All right, so again, I hope this was useful. Have a great day, and I will see you when I see you. All right, bye.